Welcome back, casual gardeners. Today's video is going to be about electroculture. It's also the first in what I hope to be a series of garden science videos. Before we really get into the topic, let's just accept that electroculture antennae are cool looking. They're kind of pretty. They look good in a garden. And I just want to say that if you have electroculture antennae or pyramids or any of those other copper shapes in your garden as yard art, then no matter what opinions I express here, you just keep doing you, okay? Electroculture as a concept dates back to the mid 18th century when it was first popularized by Jean Antoine Nollet or Abbe Nollet. He wasn't the guy who created it as an idea, but he heard about somebody in Britain electrifying their crops and reporting good results from using electricity on their crops. And Jean Antoine Nollet was a basically a court scientist in, in France. He did demonstrations of capacitance and electricity for the French court. Millet's personal reports of electroculture were that he saw improved seed germination, improved water uptake and, through the roots, and improved plant growth using electricity on his plants. The 18th century was an exciting time for electricity. It was the dawn of the electric age. Discoveries were coming fast and frequently, and we were using or attempting to use it for all sorts of novel applications. The invention of the Leiden jar made it possible to store electricity, and this opened up the possibility of using electricity for practical applications rather than just parlor tricks. And so people began to explore all sorts of things to do with electricity, some of them perhaps a little bit dubious. Electric prods were used to control horses. People thought that electricity enhanced the libido and entire beds were electrified. People wore lightning rods on their hats and took electricity baths between charged plates of, with electrical current running through them or sometimes even actual electrified baths. They thought electrified hairbrushes could cure baldness and even corsets were electrified to enhance the health of their users. Most of these applications may sound a bit silly now, but we did the same thing when we discovered radioactivity. Radioactive toothpaste, radioactive skin cream, radioactive manliness enhancers, radium in our cooking pans and crockery and utensils. And then of course, this one makes sense, radium hands on our clocks and our watches. And the same silliness, it happened when Feynman popularized quantum mechanics and made it publicly accessible for the first time. And we're seeing the same silliness again with AI. We can't be smug about it because we're still doing it. And it's quite possibly an important part of our creative process when it comes to technology. So, back to electroculture. It was born during one of those times when our creative imaginations were running wild but for electricity. And I hope you can kind of understand now why such a seemingly strange idea would have been born at the time. Electroculture can take a couple of different forms. It can take the form that scientists tested, where actual electricity from a generator on site is run near or through the plants. But then there's the other kind of electroculture, the kind that scientists haven't even bothered testing. We'll talk about that kind in just a minute. The current popular version of electroculture involves copper antennae that are put in the soil near the root zone of the plant. Copper is used because they say it's a good conductor of electricity, and it is. And the idea is that this electricity conducted into the root zone through the copper 
will help improve the plant's vitality. Spirals are considered more effective and potent than just a straight wire. And there's even a differentiation between clockwise and anti-clockwise spirals with respect to which hemisphere you're growing your plants in. And now we're getting to the reason that scientists haven't bothered to test the popular version of electroculture. Electricity flows through a circuit from areas of high charge to areas of low charge. Or electricity moves between charged masses. So the former is the electricity that you are using when you charge your phone or turn on a light. The latter is lightning or an annoying child on a shag rug. Could electroculture be using one of these types of electric flow? There is no circuit there. It's just a piece of copper wire between the sky and the soil. And while it's true that lightning passes one way or the other just fine without a circuit, that's on a much bigger scale. It's actually really hard to pin down how the antennae in electroculture are supposed to work, which is strange because now we know quite a bit about the science of electromagnetism. We know it much better than we did in the mid 18th century when electroculture was born. We know how to generate electricity in all sorts of marvelous ways. We have dance clubs that use the pressure of the footsteps and dancing of their patrons to generate electricity. That would be piezoelectricity or the electricity of deformation. We can generate electricity from differences in temperature. So that would be thermoelectricity or the thermoelectric effect. And we can actually run that backwards and change temperature using electricity. Of course, you all know that we can generate electricity using light. That would be the photovoltaic effect or solar power. But there is one way we never generate electricity, and that is with an antenna. Well, almost never. If you're a ham radio operator, you know that radio waves can create electricity or electrical current in an antenna. That's how you are able to talk to people halfway around the world. But that antenna still needs to be a part of a circuit in order for that to work. So it seems very unlikely that the antennae, which are just stuck in the ground and can't be part of a circuit, are creating electricity and electrical fields around our plants that way. So let's ignore the popular method for a minute. How have scientists' explorations of actual electroculture gone? There was an initial flurry of interest in electroculture in the 1920s and 1940s, but that died down pretty quickly when none of those scientists could actually get the thing to work. And remember, this is with actual electrical currents passing through and near the plants that were being studied. So we know for sure that there was something that could cause an effect in the plant. Most of the written resources that are referred back to by electroculture popularizers today actually do date back to the 1920s or the 1940s when there were several books published about electroculture with extensive diagrams and really much more complicated methods than the simple copper antenna in the garden method. Meanwhile, the copper antenna crowd are making a lot of claims. Two or 300% increases in yield, natural pest resistance, drought tolerance, cold tolerance. You don't have to use fertilizer ever. And these are actually some of the more believable claims that I was able to find. It seems quite likely that if any of those claims were demonstrably true, electroculture would be practiced on every farm, at least in the United States. But we don't really see that, which makes me wonder whether, you know, maybe those claims aren't true. You won't find any scientist making millions of dollars because they found a way to do 
any of those claims we just talked about using electricity. The reason for that is that electroculture is simply a holdover from the dawn of the age of electricity when it was thought that everything was possible using electricity and that electricity was the very force of life. An age when jolly groups of young men would straddle rods and shock their testicles collectively in order to improve their personal vitality and virility. Just as it's unlikely that those poor men saw an actual increase in virility, it's equally unlikely that we will see any benefit in stabbing a copper antenna into our soil. We won't see a reduction in garden pests. We won't see a reduced need for water. If that were the case, my garden would be absolutely lousy with copper antennae right now because I'm still smarting from this year's grasshopper invasion. And if it were possible for me to spend a few tens of dollars on copper and shape it into spirals to keep the grasshoppers off my crops, you know I would have done it. Like all pseudoscience, the people peddling electroculture have taken a few facts and dressed them up in miracles stitched from non sequiturs. It's true that copper conducts electricity. It's even true that dissolved copper will act as a pesticide and, unfortunately, also as a herbicide. It's true that electromagnetic radiation can be transformed by an antenna as part of a circuit into electricity. But between each of those facts, we find leaps of logic and inconsistencies with the now very familiar science of electromagnetism, as well as plant physiology. The only scientists who remain confused about how magnets work are the esteemed doctor's insane clown posse. I've been looking over my plans for next year's garden, and it looks like there is room in my plans to actually create two beds that are almost identical to each other. And that means that we've got an opening for a simple and not very scientific experiment. I am considering buying some of those pretty copper spiral antennae or making them myself and giving it a try in just one of those two beds. Do you think I should do it? Make sure you are subscribed to my channel and let me know in the comments if you think you would like to watch the setup and conclusion of an experiment in electroculture in my garden. You would be helping me out tremendously if you would let me know in the comments what topics in gardening science you would like me to explore. There's actually a lot that we could talk about. Thank you for joining me in my garden today, and I hope you have a wonderful time in your own.